There it is. All right. Good morning, all. And as is our custom, we'll begin with prayer. So please join me. Dear God, thank you that uh, we matter to you. That uh, prayer is something that is quite natural uh, for those that you have brought into your household of faith. And so thank you that you hear us, you greet us, you're uh, eager to speak to us through your word. And that's what we ask for. And uh, thank you for hearing us now in Jesus name. Amen. All right. I was just struck as I was uh, uncovering the study books with the large questions the deep issues that uh, Romans presents. Uh, so what were some of these? For instance, we thought about the three metaphors Paul used in describing redemption, redemption we have in Christ, a uh, metaphor from the law courts, and that was, of course, what? Justification. Uh, Paul used the metaphor of the temple sacrifices uh, when he was dealing with that uh, Greek word propitiation, meaning justification or covering, really. Uh, propitiation in its literal translation was mercy seat. It was that cap, that cover. Uh, to the covenant box, uh, the box that contained the Ten Commandments, the two stones. Uh, so there was that. The box is usually referred to as the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. That was the second one. And the third one was the uh, image, the metaphor of deliverance from captivity and that was deliverance in Egypt from from Pharaoh in Egypt. So uh, we've dealt with that concept again we thought about how can we know truth and we saw there were two main well books of revelation they've been called uh, the book of uh, nature revelation uh, in a general sense and then there's Revelation uh, of a special sort, which comes wrapped up in the Bible. So we considered that a matter of being able to know what is real about the unseen world and the world of sight, uh, general revelation, and then the special revelation uh, that from beginning to end, the Bible points to Jesus Christ and his deliverance. All right, so then along with Paul, we grappled with the question, how can a just God, a righteous God, pardon unrighteous people? Uh, so the matter of uh, God's remaining just and yet merciful at the same time is developed in the early chapters of Romans. Uh, and uh, it points toward the cross as the place where we can see most clearly, place in history really, uh, where we can understand both the justice of God, which necessitated the punishment of sin, uh, and the mercy of God, uh, which punishment was taken by God himself uh, in our place. So we say it's salvation by the blood of Christ um, that was shed for us on the cross. cross that happened under Roman tutelage uh, over 2,000 years ago. All right. Um, we wrestled also with this large issue of the purpose of revelation. 
What is the purpose of revelation as we see it discussed in the Bible? And uh, there are two goals that are mentioned in the scripture again and again. Uh, one of them being the uh, final goal, which is uh, to be in the presence of God, if we're thinking about human beings and perhaps their pet animals. Uh, there's the matter of God's character. Uh, we just alluded to that. He's just and merciful. Uh, he's also wise. And as we'll see today, he's powerful. And so on the basis of his power, Abraham could believe God could do some of the things he promised. Uh, so we have the uh, matter of the final goal being God. And then there's the nearby goal uh, is the term theologians have given it. The nearby goal is found in the complete renewal of sinful people. Complete renewal of sinners. Uh, and that process of renewal can be thought of as a walk. And so Paul says in his letter to the Galatians, uh, you live by the Spirit, so also walk by the Spirit, a reference to our coming uh, into a uh, new life, being born again, when we're justified by faith. Talk about that this morning. Um, but also the, uh, the matter of, all right, now that we belong to God, we're part of his household of faith, uh, what is our responsibility? And Paul makes it clear. Others do too throughout the scripture that we are to walk walk with God. Uh, the Lord is shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. There it is. We learn more and more what it means to be righteous. So uh, then, of course, we uh, have been dealing also as we're cataloging some of the uh, intellectual uh, issues that we have been facing. There's the matter of God's sovereign rule and how to square that with the responsibility of people. So these are some of the things we've been looking at. <laughs> And we may want to transport some of these questions and issues into the uh, Q&A period at the end of our time this morning. Uh, other issues to think about as we move through Romans, uh, the limits of human reason, uh, the whole matter of people's reason, Humanity having a reasonable brain. Uh, all of this has been <clears throat> debated for centuries before Christ and after. Uh, it was in the Renaissance that there was a new emphasis on the place of reason. So the age of reason as over against religion uh, and it was often, unfortunately, over against uh, because it was a thought that <clears throat> uh, religion had to do with something uh, of, of faith, certainly, uh, but not reason. It wasn't reasonable. Uh, you just believe. And how many uh, children have been taught, uh, unfortunately, by their parents no more than well, just believe, rather than recognizing that there was good and sufficient reason to believe. And we'll see that uh, Abraham demonstrated that uh, in his lack of faith. 
All right. Um, the limits of human reason are due, what? Not only to our sinful selves, which distorts everything in our lives, our wills, our emotions uh, are affected by sin and our reason also. Uh, but it's not only our sinful self that distorts, limits our reason. It's also uh, the um, well. Let's see. What do I have in my notes here? Limits of reason are due not only to our sinful selves, oh, but also to our finiteness. We are finite. We are created uh, in God's image. Yes. But uh, that doesn't mean we're uh, created divine as he is, uh, or that our uh, humanness isn't without limit. Uh, so it's both our sinful self and our uh, being creatures that limit uh, uh, the use of reason in our lives. Uh, and then, uh, along with our consideration of reason, there's the uh, matter of our conscience. And Paul uses the word twice in Romans. Uh, let's just look at that now. Romans chapter 2, verse 9. <clears throat> There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Uh, that doesn't seem to say anything about the conscience. So uh, we'll have to uh, deal with that later on. Uh, let's see if we can do better with Romans 9, verse 1. Mm -hmm. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart goes on to say, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brother. So he's speaking about his concern for the Jewish nation, Jewish people. And he uh, enlists uh, the reality of his conscience. My conscience confirms. All right, so what is the conscience? Some have said that this is uh, a reliable, totally reliable moral compass by which mankind decides what is right and wrong. Well, Paul allows that there is a place for conscience. Here it is, um, chapter 2, verse 15. Since they show that the requirements of the law, he's speaking now of Gentiles, who don't have the Ten Commandments. Uh, there have been various codes of law, the Code of Hammurabi. Uh, but uh, here, Paul is uh, dealing with the fact that uh, all people have access to uh, the moral directives of the conscience. So he says in verse 15, since they show that the requirements of the law, that is, the requirements of the commandments of God, the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. And then he goes on. So the conscience is... Uh, a mechanism, a reality, part of what it means to be a human being. And all people, Paul says, have that to go on. 
even though not all people have the laws of Moses that have been given to them in a special way. All right, so um, human reason, the conscience, and then today uh, we will talk a little bit more about the righteousness of God. It's very hard uh, not to talk about the righteousness of God uh, in any of the uh, portions of scripture look at because that's his uh, character and he has placed his character as a stamp on all that he's created so there is this matter of righteousness now what is it well uh good old webster uh collegiate number nine uh ninth college dictionary webster what is he have to say well definitions as is often and almost invariably the case there are a number of meanings uh first of all righteousness is pleasing to the eye or mind especially uh because of uh fresh charming flawless quality well, what does that mean? Uh, we can uh, make educated guesses on some of these meanings, but uh, anyway, this flawless quality, which is pleasing to the eye or mind. Uh, the third definition Webster gives for righteousness is that it's clean or pure, and maybe the purity rings a bell with us more than some of the other definitions. Another one is conforming with established rules. Oh, well, that's fine as far as it goes, but it doesn't deal with the matter of uh, who did the establishing of the rules. And uh, is there any family that hasn't experienced some questioning of this uh, business of who establishes the rules uh, when children uh, grow up and uh, develop a little more independence, <laughs> uh, they may well say, well, you're just making these rules, but I don't have to do them. I don't have to pick up the clothes on the floor. And like it. It's my room. I make my own rules. So on. A uh, synonym for righteousness is impartial and unbiased. All right. So we have some of these uh, definitions of righteousness, righteousness of God. Uh, well, who is righteous? That's another issue. Uh, that the Bible raises. And it's very clear that God is righteous. God is fair in judging a person. That's another definition. Uh, righteousness, fairness. God is fair. Uh, and again, with um, siblings, haven't we seen, you're not playing fair. That's not fair. Uh, that's... Uh, one of the worst things you can say about a person. Uh, so God is fair in judging a person. Uh, let's take a look at Psalm 7 that deals with that. Psalm 7, verses 9 and 11. All right. Um, and this is a direct prayer uh, on the part of David. Psalm 7 is attributed to David, King David. Verse 9, O righteous God, who searches minds and hearts, bring to an end the violence of the wicked, make the righteous secure. So there are the notion of wickedness and righteousness is brought into association with God. 
who is righteous. All right. Um, verse 11, just a little further down, God is a righteous judge. All right. And somewhere in the scripture, it talks about uh, how in the world, probably in Romans, how in the world can uh, God uh, judge the world righteously if he himself is not righteous? So raises that question. God is fair in judging a person. God is impartial in judgments. We've just looked at that. Uh, God looks on the heart. That's a point that is made in trying to determine, well, what is right and what is wrong? And there came a time when uh, God's servant had to uh, name uh, a king. And uh, we can read about that, in fact. Uh, First Kings, let's turn to that. First Kings chapter 8. First Kings 8. First Kings eight and verse thirty nine. And this is all part of Solomon's uh, great prayer of dedication, uh, the dedication of the temple. And in dedicating the temple, he uh, offered a number of prayers uh, for different situations. And uh, so in verse 39, he's dealing with what do you do uh, with various difficulties in life, uh, such as famines, verse 37, or plagues, or blights, mildew, locusts. It's almost endless. Or when an enemy besieges them in any of their cities, whatever disaster or disease may come. And when a prayer or plea is made by any of your people, Israel, each one aware of the afflictions of his own heart, and spreading out his hands toward this temple, then, and here is uh, the petition, then hear from heaven, your dwelling place, forgive and act. Deal with each man according to all he does, since you know his heart, for you alone know the hearts of all men, so that they will fear you all the time that they live in the land you gave our fathers. And then goes on to speak about the foreigner. But here it is, um, the difficulties uh, that uh, flesh is heir to, uh, to use Shakespeare's phrase. Uh, these are occasions when people are inclined to call out to God for help. And when that is the case, then God, who understands the heart and the mind, uh, will uh, have mercy and forgive. All right, so God looks on the heart. He's not impressed by outward appearances. Um, the passage that I thought we were going to look at uh, is, is not this one in 1 Kings, but uh, in the Old Testament, it does speak about uh, uh, Samuel coming and uh, speaking to the leadership in Israel, and uh, the oldest son uh, of Saul was uh, the one that was put forward. He was tall and handsome and uh, eminently uh, eligible 
to serve as the next king. Uh, but Samuel, uh, who was ready to crown him, was told by God, no, this is not the one I have in mind. And God on that occasion made it clear that he was not a God who looked on appearances, uh, but rather he looked on the heart, knew what was in man. And uh, so uh, the righteous God intervened on that occasion and said, no, uh, there's someone else uh, that we will have as our king. All right, so God's character, uh, he's not only fair, he's impartial in his judgments, he looks on the heart rather than outward appearances. Uh, his character is righteous in that his words are said to be pure. Proverbs 30, please. Turn to Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke, rebuke you and prove you a liar. So departing from God's truth and God's word involves uh, that which is false. Uh, he says, uh, I will prove you a liar if you depart from my words, depart from what I have indicated is true. All right, so his words are pure. And then uh, the last uh, aspect of God's character that we'll uh, look at is described in Isaiah chapter 6. You turn to that, please. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. Uh, and we have here a description uh, of some seraphs, uh, a heavenly being. Verse 2, each with six wings. Two wings covered their faces, two wings their feet, two uh, they were flying. And what were they calling to one another? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. All right. So here is a, uh, a heavenly chorus uh, calling it as it is, not only as they see it. And they're saying, God is holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And uh, that is picked up by none other than the Apostle Peter. So please turn to 1 Peter. And it's not a, a verse of scripture that's hard to remember. Just one word, really, repeated. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. No, I'm sorry, verse 15. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. All right, First Peter 1, 16. Just simply repeating what the prophet Isaiah had put out there uh, some eight centuries, more or less, before Christ was on earth. Long time before. All right, so God is righteous. But then the question comes, is mankind righteous in any sense? And mankind is apt to be both godless and wicked. Romans one eighteen. Catalog of all the unrighteousness that one finds in men. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 and following, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godly 
godlessness and wickedness of men. There's a lot of it around. Uh, God looks from heaven uh, and reveals his wrath from heaven against all this wickedness uh, of men who do what? They suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. We're back here in the area of general revelation, aren't we? Revelation that God gives to all mankind through his universe, through his creation. Since what, 19, verse 19, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. So that's the conclusion here that Paul wants to come to, but this is the classical passage in scripture uh, that speaks about God revealing reality through his creation, general revelation. Uh, Romans found in Romans chapter one, uh, verses 18 and 19. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, this uh, suppressing of the truth results in a whole host of things uh, that follow along here uh, in uh, verse 21 and following. For although they knew God, that is to say, people knew about God and knew him in that sense, or although, although they knew God, verse 21, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Have a number of uh, concepts brought together here in a powerful way. Uh, that uh, their thinking became futile, foolish hearts uh, were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, so they deceived themselves. Self-deception, is that something that is in any kind of coinage today in the world? Yes, of course. Self-deception happens all the time, especially when it's the other person involved. So there's this matter of uh, being uh, self-deceiving. Although they claim to be wise, they became fools. And verse 23, exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. So the whole matter of idolatry is a matter of foolishness on the part of man who wants to deny the reality of God as it confronts him in this general revelation of creation. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, becomes an idolater. And it was idolatry that sent Israel packing. It was idolatry that was the cause of Israel being captured by the Babylonians and the Assyrians. All right, uh, then uh, mankind, uh, it says that... Um, Verse 24, therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity. And then he uh, expands on that a bit. And um, then verse 28, furthermore, 
uh, since mankind did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, <clears throat> he gave them over to a depraved mind. All right, so before we have uh, a mind that is futile and their hearts foolish, here God gives them over to a depraved mind. Uh, who today hasn't looked at the TV and some of the um, programs that have been presented, some of the actions that one sees on the streets. Uh, who hasn't uh, thought in terms of, well, that's really a depraved situation that's being presented that's being offered up uh, as entertainment, whatever it may be. Uh, there are these uh, realities in our so-called civilization that really reflect a depraved, a twisted, uh, an evil mind. And then he goes on, in verse 29, they have become filled because God has kind of let them loose in a way. Um, he's given them over to a depraved mind. And so they have become filled, verse 29, with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. He goes on, they are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree, that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Why, ah, it's a dreary list, isn't it? Mm -hmm. of, of the qualities that uh, attach themselves to humanity. Well, is anyone righteous? Paul's catalog of the forms of wickedness is pretty devastating. All are seen to be under sin, Jews and Gentiles alike. And then Paul concludes in chapter 3, verse 19, that everybody comes under the umbrella of God's judgment. The whole world is held accountable to God, chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. So the Gentile has no excuse, although that excuse was being used, uh, that they didn't have any special revelation from God. Uh, they didn't have the Ten Commandments. It was only the Jews. And the Jews, on their part, were only too glad to uh, claim a special place in, under the sun, uh, that they were God's people. They had the law uh, and various other things. They had the prophets and so on. Um, so, uh, no one could tell them what to do. And uh, it was considered a, a very uh, good thing uh, for a Jew in their prayers for various peoples uh, to pray for God's wrath to fall upon the Gentiles. And uh, more specifically, to pray that any Jewish woman who was pregnant would miscarry. Uh, these became very uh, concrete and very real. So uh, Paul concludes that the whole world is held accountable um, because if the Gentile didn't have the written commandments of 
of uh, Moses and the Ten Commandments, uh, they did have conscience, uh, which would give them some guidance as to right and wrong. Now, uh, we have to look at something here sooner or later that seems confusing, and we just need to deal with it. Paul seems uh, to grant that some can achieve righteousness. So we've been saying all along, uh, and rightly so from the scriptures, uh, that there's none who is righteous, not one. Uh, and that is because no one keeps the law perfectly. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. The, the standard is very strenuous. The bar is very high uh, that uh, applies to right and wrong and whether people are righteous or not. All right, so... Uh, Romans 2, verses 12 to 16, seems to say that it's possible for people to be righteous. Let's look at that. Chapter 2, beginning of verse 12. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. All right, so he's referring here again uh, to Jew and Gentile. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. That sounds on the face of it as if Paul is talking about the fact that people can obey the law and then they will be declared righteous on that basis. Goes on to say, indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, uh, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending. So there's this suggestion here that whether a person's a Jew or a Gentile, uh, if they keep the law and show that it's written on their heart, that's the important thing. Then they will be declared righteous. Well, uh, those who obey the law will be declared righteous. Um, I'm suggesting here on the basis of uh, the commentaries and my studies that uh, Paul is just speaking theoretically here. In reality, no one's able to keep the law. He's made that point uh, indirectly in several ways. But no one keeps the law perfectly. Uh, if a person is seen to seek glory, honor, and immortality, uh, and then he will have eternal life, he will have eternal life as one who has the gift of faith. So if by chance you come across a person and they seem to be very kind, and after further association with them, uh, it turns out that there are many fine qualities this person and you're inclined to say, that's a good person, or that's even a righteous person. If that's the case, then we need to say, well, yes, but we know where that good behavior comes from. It comes from the Holy Spirit who has led the person and uh, taught their hearts to love God and has uh, guided people in the matter of following uh, what is what is righteous. So if a person is seen to seek glory, honor, and immortality, Romans 3, verse 7, uh, then 
uh, they will have, uh, God will give them eternal life uh, as simply a matter of recognizing that they trust him, that they believe in him, that they listen to his commands, that they consider the laws of God uh, to be valid guidelines for them. So in verse 7, to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. That's to be understood as those who are allowing their faith to be expressed in works. And this is what James is talking about in his epistle. Uh, he talks about those who are proud of uh, believing in Christ as their Savior, uh, as if it was something that they had accomplished, rather than recognizing that faith was a gift. Romans uh, 6, verse uh, what verse, is here? verse 23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So when Paul's talking about eternal life uh, back there in uh, the earlier chapters of Romans, uh, people who uh, are persistent and doing good, wanting to glorify God, honor him, and so on, they will be given eternal life. It's because they have been given the gift already of belief. And it's on the basis of their truly belief uh, that they have sought to be faithful to God's laws and obedient to his will. And therefore, uh, they are on the road to eternal life. Uh, eternal life begins, as has been pointed out, the moment one believes, but it continues through the life of the believer uh, into heaven and then uh, goes on forever. So this vast gift of eternal life uh, it is a gift. It's not something that's earned. North. Uh, so we point out again that obedience is not an affirmation of salvation by works, something we do. Justification is something we receive as a gift. We've already looked at Romans 6.23. Uh, Romans 5, verse 5, makes the same point. And hope, Paul wrote there, chapter 5, verse 5, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts. His love, there's righteousness, a summary of righteousness, really, his love has been poured into our hearts. How? By the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. So there the language makes it very clear that uh, the faith that we have in Christ, any of us here at the table or uh, in our homes, any of us who have a genuine faith in Christ, it's a gift. And sometimes we shake our heads and wonder, well, what did we do to deserve that, you know, and so-and-so doesn't believe, I believe, but they don't believe. Uh, what did I do to earn that? Well, nothing. You just received that gift. Uh, think of a person, you, who goes to the door to sign for a package from the postman, who is God, you're asked to sign for the package simply to prove that you're the person the package, price and death for you, is intended for. That you are the one that, yes, he died for. You are not asked to pay anything. Christ died for you over 2,000 years ago. Once the signature is given, faith, the package is yours. And then you have it forever. And this was the truth behind James' admonition. Uh, let's turn to James, chapter 1, verse 22. 
James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man, verse 25, who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. All right, so there is this matter of genuine faith producing works, but works is not that which qualifies one for eternal life. It's the faith that has been received as a gift. And so uh, this is consistent all the way through the scripture. We could look at John chapter 1, where he's speaking about those who are children of God. And um, well, I'm going to start in chapter 1, verse 6. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. This is a statement about the incarnation of Christ, that it, it was, in a way, a process. It happened in history. He was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him, his family. He was rejected. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, that is, believed in his character and what he did, yet all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Not all people are God's children. There's a Negro spiritual, all God's children got shoes. I'm going to talk about the shoes, going to walk about in my shoes. All God's children. Uh, well, that was uh, a Negro spiritual and was probably in reaction to uh, the false teaching that uh, blacks could not become uh, God's children. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human descent, nor a husband's will, but born of God. Uh, those are the ones uh, who uh, are going to honor God uh, with their lives. Okay. So, um, James, uh, if a person doesn't demonstrate in good deeds that he is a believer, what did he call? He called it, uh, it was dead. The faith was dead. Um, so, uh, pretty strong words. If a person believes there is one God but doesn't show a life or reflecting good deeds, he is no better than the demons. Demons believe that Jesus is Christ. Uh, they don't doubt it, uh, but uh, obviously they don't uh, want to let it uh, lead them in, into good works. So um, he's no better than the demons if he just simply believes but doesn't really believe. If his belief and faith in Christ doesn't make a difference in his life, 
then it's as if he had no faith at all. Faith was dead. Paul cites Abraham as an example of someone who is declared righteous because of his faith, not his works. Um, yeah, Romans chapter 4. Verses 1 to 3. What shall we say then? Paul says that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. All right, uh, I think we may be uh, about that time. We'll take a few more moments. Uh, there um, is another passage here, Romans 4, 9 to 12. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We've been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it? credited was it after he was circumcised uh, which is what you would expect if you're saying that a person is saved by his works circumcision you're obedient to the command to circumcise the firstborn son uh, and the other sons as well uh, if you uh, see that as the ticket to heaven the way by which you earn God's righteousness, then you're wrong. Uh, that's the point that Paul's making. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So he couldn't be more clear. Uh, it, it isn't you're being circumcised that saved you. You're being circumcised is a sign, just as baptism was a sign later on, a different age, uh, is a sign that you, in your heart, really believe that Jesus died for you. Uh, so Romans 9 uh, 4, 9 through 12. Romans 4, 13. Uh, God uh, credited his faith uh, to Abraham as righteousness. Uh, one more and then we're through. Romans 4, 18 to 22. Notice the quality of Abraham's faith. Against all hope, this is verse 18, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as death. Since he was about a hundred years old, that Sarah's womb was also dead. Uh, it's interesting that as you look at the passage in Genesis chapter 17, we won't take time to do that now, but uh, Genesis 17, 17 and 18 uh, shows that Abraham fell on his face and laughed when God told him that he was going to have a son by uh, Sarah. Uh, you know, he, he said, well, I'm 100 years old. You know, this is a ridiculous God. Uh, but God insisted, and, and he acceded to that. Uh, so he uh, believed then, uh, even as he had believed earlier on when God had spoken to him about his descendants being as the stars of the heavens, sands of the seashore. So uh, Abraham weakened in his faith at that point. Uh, he was already uh, declared righteous by God before that occurred. Uh, 
So as those who are believers today, uh, we know that we have been counted as righteous forever in God's sight. And then we come along and we, uh, in one way or another, live for ourselves. We don't love our neighbors as we ought to. And it's very apparent uh, to ourselves, if nobody else, that that's the case. Do we lose our sanctification? Do we lose our salvation? No. Uh, God will show us a better way. He will maybe punish us uh, to get our attention, uh, to help us to grow, to be righteous. But whatever uh, God does by way of discipline, it's out of love for us. Uh, Hebrews points that out. And so uh, we uh, can say that, yes, Abraham showed faith. He was credited to him as righteousness. Later on, when God said, all right, Abraham, I know you don't have the child that I promised you, uh, but he's coming. And that's when uh, uh, Abraham demonstrated that his faith was wobbling and weak, just as uh, we experience from time to time. Uh, but then uh, God had mercy on him and kept working with him. And so eventually uh, Abraham came to believe. So uh, in fact, he believed that God was able to bring this child who is now about uh, 13, 14, 15 years old, uh, Isaac, God was able to raise him from the dead if, in fact, Abraham went through with the sacrifice to killing his son. Uh, if that were the case, Abraham nevertheless believed God was in it and would make it come right. So Hebrews 11, and we'll close with that. I think I said we'll close with the last one. We'll really close now. Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises and uh, declared righteous on that occasion, Genesis 15, he who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. 19, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So there is this uh, reality to faith that even when it's not perfect among believers, was it perfect for Abraham? Not for ourselves. Even when it's not perfect, that faith is genuine. It's believing in the person and work of Christ. And that can never be taken away from us. God will continue to work with us until he brings us to perfection. Paul said in one of his letters, I think to the Philippians, it's not that I've already attained this goal or that I'm already perfect. Not, not yet, uh, but I press on. So we too are encouraged to press on. Now, shall we have End. an ending prayer and then a closing then? Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your um, wonderful love for us, your patience with us, your faithfulness toward us. As we think of Abraham, uh, we think of uh, others that we have known who truly had faith and lived really uh, pretty wonderful lives. Not perfect, but really good. We thank you for those people given to us, as well as the people in Scripture. Uh, and Lord, now we pray that we'll show our gratitude this afternoon. 
and we thank you for hearing us now. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Um,